Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, as we bow in your presence, we ask today, God, first to cleanse our hearts. Forgive our sins, dear God, and grant us an infilling of your Holy Spirit. For me particularly, because my burden is so heavy, grant me your spirit. Remember the words of David in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, when he said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Father, put your word in the very organ of speech, my tongue, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be acceptable in your sight and be a blessing for those for whom Jesus shed his blood. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. On the first night of this week of prayer, our subject was, the United States has three presidents. We had a second subject, second title, but we'll ignore that. And we discovered from the Bible that there are two invisible kingdoms operating on the earth. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. We also discovered that all inhabitants of the earth are under one or the other of these two kingdoms. Those in the kingdom of God are those whose lives conform with his standard of righteousness, which is his law. Using the principle of opposites, those in the kingdom of Satan are those whose lives are not in conformity with God's great standard of righteousness, his law, which expresses his character. We discovered to our alarm that those in the kingdom of Satan cannot get up and leave. Because from Isaiah 14, verse 17, Satan does not release his prisoners. Someone infinitely more powerful than Satan has to restrain him, has to bind him, and in that process, release his captives. And that person is none other than Jesus Christ. We also learned to our relief that anyone in the kingdom of Satan can switch to God's kingdom at the invitation, of course, of Jesus Christ, calling on him to release them. And that can be done instantaneously. And some responded to a call on the first night. And the call was, if you wanted to switch from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of Christ. And I've been praying, by the way, for those who came forward in answer to that call. Last night, our subject was, no law, no life. And we discovered that the entire universe operates by law. The universe is made up of matter. Matter is solid, liquid, and gas. Solids obey laws. Liquids obey laws. Gases obey laws. Laws express the behavior of a thing or a person. We also discovered that in creation, God had different levels of existence. One, the inanimate things he made, like the rocks and the stars. Then those at a low level of life, like trees. Those at a higher level of life, the animals. And of course, the highest expression of God's creative power on the earth, the human beings. And all of them have to behave. What distinguishes a human being is that his or her behavior comes from the mind. Unlike an animal or a plant or a rock, the behavior of a human being made in the image of God comes from a part of that person that is neither solid nor liquid nor gas and consequently does not function based on the laws that govern solids, liquids, and gases, but functions on laws that proceed from God himself, and that is his moral law, the Ten Commandments. Tonight, heart to heart, which is also our theme. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. We shall read verse 34. Matthew 12, reading from verse 34. It's three minutes to seven. Time flies very quickly. Matthew 12, reading from verse 34. This is Jesus Christ speaking. And Jesus says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, finish the verse, the mouth speaketh. Now this is a cardinal, 
fundamental principle of human behavior, conduct, and expression. Everything a human being does is rooted and has its source in that person's heart. Or you may use the word mind, but we'll use heart. Let me say that again. Our speech, our thoughts, our actions are rooted and proceed from the heart. And so Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? What he meant by ye being evil was, how can ye, having evil hearts, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He proceeds in verse 35, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth what? That's the only thing a good heart can produce. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth what? The Bible is a book of opposites. Always remember that. Your heart and mine either produces good or evil, and that's it. And so Jesus says, what you produce comes from the heart. If what you produce is good, it is because it came from a good heart. And so, as I told you last night, a quotation from Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2. Every act is judged by the motives that prompt it. In Mind, Character, and Personality, book 1, page 348, paragraph 5, Ellen White makes this very, very disturbing statement. Many acts which pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, will, when closely investigated, be found to be prompted by wrong motives. And she concludes by saying, many receive applause for virtues which they do not possess. In other words, here comes a man, and he makes a million-dollar contribution to the church building fund, and the church puts a plaque on the wall, on every wall, in his name. God examines the reason why he gave that gift. And there are no plaques with his name on the walls in heaven. Because God reads not the act. He reads the heart from which the act proceeds. Let me repeat. I'll give you a different quotation. Child Guidance, page 201, paragraph 3. Every course of action has a twofold character and importance. It is either virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, according to the motive which prompts it. What I'm trying to say is, everything we do, it receives its determination from God based on the condition of our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are what? The issues of life. Now the Hebrew word for issues means the outgoings or the outflowings. Everything connected to human existence begins in the heart. And so the Bible says, you keep your heart with all diligence, not some, with all diligence, because every issue of human existence comes from the heart. So I repeat the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, 12, verse 34. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now let's take a look at an evil heart. Listen to Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 20. Our subject is heart to heart. Mark, the very next book, chapter 7, reading from verse 20. The words of Jesus Christ. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. In other words... Sin does not proceed from the outside in. Sin proceeds from the inside out. Is that clear? You didn't convince me that it's clear. If it's clear, say amen. Amen. 
evil begins in the heart. In other words, no one can make you evil. No one can make me evil. We are conveniently or inconveniently born with an evil nature. So Jesus says, that which cometh out of the man, I think I heard of one, that defileth the man. Let's look at another heart. Galatians 5, reading from verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do not be deceived by the wording of Paul. He does not say there is no law. He says there is no law against love. There is no law against joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. There is no law against those. And using the principle of opposites, it means there is a law for them. These things are consistent with the law. But if you read from verse 19 of Galatians 5, we find a list of things against which there is a law. But the the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Meaning the list is not complete. There is a law against those. There is no law against love, joy, peace, long-suffering. There's a law that supports it. But whether it's adultery, fornication, and cleanness, verse 19, Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Galatians 5, 22, both proceed from where? The heart. All right. Let me repeat Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, The mouth speaketh. Remember that mankind was made how? In the image of God. Ella White writes, Man was to bear God's image both in outward resemblance and in character. Someone should have said amen for that. What she's saying is in some way God looks like us. Both in outward resemblance And in character. So that some of the things we do, the way human beings exist and interact and function, is probably the way God conducts himself in the heavenly courts. It is also true of God that out of the abundance of his heart, he speaks. Now go with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20, reading from verse 1. Our subject is heart to heart. Exodus 20, reading from verse 1, the second book of the Bible. Do we have that? The Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the commandments go all the way down to verse 17. Now, what is God doing according to verse 1? He is speaking. There's a sharp person to my left. There's sharp people to my right, but they said nothing. The Bible says, and God spake all these words saying. Now, using the principle that Jesus Christ expressed in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, what can we conclude about the source of the Ten Commandments? They came from where? The heart of God. Thank you. Got one solitary, isolated amen. When God spoke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, He spoke from His heart. When I say God spoke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, do I mean God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost? 
I'm not suggesting three gods. I'm referring to the members of the Trinity. Which one said, thou shall have no other gods before me? Was it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost? And we need to establish that. All right, you're ahead of me and that's okay. I'll catch up with you. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, For there is one God and one what? Mediator between God and men. And who is that? The man Christ Jesus. Now, think with me. What is the function of a mediator? A mediator is someone who stands where? Between two warring parties. A mediator has no words of his own. You didn't get it. My fault. Let me say it again. When you mediate between two parties, you take the expression from one and pass it to the other, and then the one on the right speaks to you, and you pass that to the one on the left. And that's how a mediator functions. The mediator does not step back and let the two parties talk to each other. No, the mediator stands between, and the mediator is the medium of communication. Do you understand me? Whatever party on the right says comes through him or her. Whatever party on the left says comes through him or her. That's a mediator. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus now. We have some insight from the writings of Ellen White. Conflict and Courage, page 20, paragraph 7. After his transgression, referring to Adam, God would communicate with man only through Christ and his angels. After his transgression, Adam's transgression, God would communicate with man only through Christ and his angels. So that the person who came down into the garden to talk to Adam and Eve after the sin that he committed was Christ. He came to speak for his father. The person who stood on Mount Sinai and said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me was Jesus Christ. And of him, the apostle Paul writes in Hebrews 12, 26, whose voice then shook the earth. And so it was Christ. But I said earlier, a mediator's words are not his. A mediator gets his words from one of the two parties between whom he is mediating. And so when Jesus said, thou shalt have no other gods before me, he was saying what was given to him by whom? The Father. Now. When the Father gave the commandments to Jesus Christ in heaven before Christ came down, from where did the Father speak them? From his heart. We have the first step in the process. From the heart of the Father to whom? Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus spoke on Mount Sinai, from what source was he speaking? His heart. And what was in his heart? Exactly what was where? In the Father's heart. You were bright tonight. God bless you. Well, you were bright last night too. Let me say it again. This is very important. What came out of the Father's heart to the Son? The Son came down with lightning and thunder and smoke and all thousands of angels on Sinai. The Bible says the entire mountain was on fire. It was smoking. It was shaking. There was an earthquake that shook the earth. And with his father's words, in his heart, God the Son spoke from his heart. And it was he who said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. From the heart of the father to the heart of the son. Before we take the next step, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy is a recapitulation of the events of the Israelites after 40 years of wind, uh, wandering in the wilderness. 
and it's a book of long speeches by Moses. He's rehearsing and reviewing the experience. And in the process of doing that, he reviews the Ten Commandments. So there are two places where you read the Ten Commandments. But the commandments in Exodus represent the actual speaking of Christ. The commandments in uh, the Deuteronomy is Moses rehearsing the commandments to remind the people. All right. After Moses does that in uh, chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, look at verse 22. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice. What are the next few words? And he added what? No more. In other words, that was it. He did not have to say anything else. All that Jesus spoke were the Ten Commandments. That was all that was in his heart for the Israelites. And that was all that was in the Father's heart to the mediator Jesus Christ to be given to the Israelites. Now the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The commandments of God the law of God represents the abundance of the heart of God. These laws we hate. These commandments we despise. This decalogue, this standard of righteousness for the Old Testament and the New, which so many churches disregard because they call themselves New Testament churches, this represents the heart of God. And so God gave his heart to his son and he told the son, give my heart to my people. And how does God give his heart to his people? Jeremiah chapter 31, reading verse 33. You are familiar with that verse. Jeremiah chapter 31, reading verse 33, the Bible says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law where? In the inward parts and write it in their heart and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now the Bible says under the new covenant. Now don't be confused by the expression new covenant. Don't allow that expression to lead you to think that that covenant began with the death of Christ. The new covenant, let me tell you very briefly, is the everlasting covenant ratified by the blood of Christ. Before Christ died, the everlasting covenant was in existence. It was effective on the basis of promise. So Abraham was saved by the new covenant. So was Adam and Shem and Seth and Enoch and Noah and Joseph you name them, and Elisha, and Elijah, and David, you name them, they were all saved by the provisions of the new covenant. But it got the name new covenant after Jesus Christ died. So the everlasting covenant was called the new covenant after Christ actually shed his blood and ratified that covenant with his blood. Now, so when the Bible says, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts, in the inward parts, and write it in their hearts. God is saying, what he did for Abraham is what he wants to do for us. Because there's only one way to be saved. Are you with me? There isn't an Old Testament way to be saved and a New Testament way to be saved. There is one way to be saved, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ, his blood, his all-sufficient atonement. That's the only way to be saved, regardless on what side of the cross you are positioned. But what I want to stress, in this covenant, in the old and the new, what God said he does is he does what? He writes his law, where? On our hearts. What law? The law that was spoken from Sinai. Now let's backtrack all the way to eternity. This law came from where? The Father's heart. And he gave it to whom? The Son. And, it, and from the Son's heart on Sinai, the Son speaking from his heart, he spoke the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. 
And they should by faith have accepted that the only means of salvation was through the same Jesus Christ who came down and spoke the commandments. And God's desire is to take the same commandments, let me drop the word commandments, the same contents from the heart of the Father. Are you with me? The same contents from the heart of the Son and he places that in our hearts. So that when we receive the commandments of God through faith in Jesus Christ, we are receiving the heart of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. The very heart of God. And he writes it on the heart. The Bible says everything proceeds From where? The heart. We read in Deuteronomy 5.22, he added how much more? No more. So that all God requires of you and me. Are you following me? All God requires, tell me what it is. Obedience to his law. But let's drop the word law. Since our carnal nature hates the word. All God requires is that we live in conformity with the contents of his heart. All God requires is that we live our lives based on the principles that flowed from the heart of Christ. And those principles first flowed from the heart of the Father. Ellen White writes in Zarephages, page 19, paragraph 2, The love that seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. The laws that every human agent is to obey comes, flows from the heart of divine love. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 216, paragraph 3. The heart of God is the source of the Ten Commandments. And for hundreds and thousands of years, God has been saying to the world, Here is my heart. Here is my heart. This is who I am in a way that you with your limited mind can comprehend. Here I am. Here is my heart, says God. Is that not what boyfriends expect of girlfriends and girlfriends of boyfriends? Give me your heart, not your spleen, your heart. And God says, here is my heart. It's a heart of love. Love for God. Love for your fellow man. But since humanity is limited just by being created and then doubly and triply limited by virtue of sin, God had to express his love in a way that a limited fallen mind can understand. That's why we have thou shalt not. But you can read the commandments this way. When Christ is in the heart, you will have no other gods before me. Are you with me? When the heart is renewed, you will not worship images. When you surrender to Jesus Christ, you will not take his name in vain. When you've been redeemed by the blood, you will keep the seventh day Sabbath. When you realize your insufficiency and realize your hope is only in the atonement of Jesus Christ, you will honor your father and your mother. When you see that there's nothing in you you can present to God, you will kill no one. When you realize to your embarrassment and mine, all our righteousness and filthy rags, we will not commit adultery. When we surrender to the overpowering love of God, we will not steal. We will not bear false witness. We will not covet. See the commandments that way. When the heart is given to God. God says, from my heart. And most of the world says to God, I don't want your heart. Give me Satan's heart. Why do I say that? The Bible is a book of opposites. Ellen White writes, Desire of Hades, page 466, paragraph 3, Every soul that refuses to give itself to God is under the control of another power. He is not his own. 
Mind, character, and personality, book 1, page 13, paragraph 3. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. It is one or the other, the heart of God or the heart of Satan, one or the other. The mind of a sinner is no different from the mind of Satan, only in the degree of, of the, in the area of intensity, Satan is more able to express his wickedness than you and I are able. But the mind is essentially the same. A little apple is no different from a big one. And so God offers his heart. Think of the honor. Think of the privilege that God would offer you his heart. And with that heart in our breast, our rib cage, wherever that cavity is called, what comes out? The life of God. Let me explain from a physical level. In uh, Child Guidance, page 45, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes The whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. Let me say that again. The whole natural world is designed, meaning deliberately arranged by God, to be an interpreter of the things of God. Child Guidance, page 46, paragraph 3. In the things of nature, God has placed in the hands of the children of men the key to unlock the treasure house of his word. The unseen is illustrated by the seen. Divine wisdom, eternal truth, infinite grace are understood by the things that God has made. The natural world aids us in understanding spiritual things. Let's look at the natural world. Now, we just said that God gives us his heart. Now, I said last night the law is life to those who are converted. It's condemnation to the sinner. What is the function of the heart physiologically? The major function. To do what? Pump what? Blood. The Bible says that the life is where? In the blood. Genesis 9.4, uh, Leviticus 17.11. The life is in blood. The blood. Now let's get a spiritual lesson from the natural world. Physically, we are part of the natural world. Our hearts pump blood to every extremity of the body, right or wrong. Yes, it does. Now, spiritually, if the heart you have is the heart of God, what life does that heart pump? The life of God. And so Paul can say, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, say it for me, Christ, what, liveth in me. Don't ask me how, I don't know. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is very clear, Christ lives in me. The life of Christ, says Paul, is the power that distinguishes my life. When the heart of God is received by you and me, it pumps the life of God. Satan understands that. And he has launched a thousand year old, many thousand year old battle with great success against the heart of God, which is God's law, a law of love. And many Christians who say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, they hate his law. And so Jesus says, if you love me, live by my heart. The translation is correct. <laughs> if you love me, live according to my heart. And the heart of God is his law. A law of love. A law of unselfishness. A law which has no place, no room for self. My brothers and sisters, it's 29 minutes after 7. Heart to heart. Let me bring something else to your attention before I close. What is the one response God requires when he gives a command? What's the one thing he wants? Discussion or obedience? 
Follow me closely. Don't sleep. That's all he wants. But when God's heart is in you, how do you obey? From what? From the heart. Now, when we do something from the heart, how do we do it? Miserably? No. When it's done from the heart, we do it what? Gladly, whether it's right or wrong. When a criminal commits a crime from the heart, he takes pride in his crime. When we do what's right from the heart, we do it gladly. And Jesus, when he came as a human being, he had the same heart. And so it was said of him in Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, finish it for me. Yea, thy is where? Within my heart. It is because his father's law was in his heart that Jesus says, I do always the things that please him, John 8, 29. And Jesus as a human being, had the Father's heart in his heart, and we as human beings, like Christ, can have that heart. And that's the only way you and I can be saved. You can have all the good works you like. Church membership, give a million dollars, and you have seven offices in the church at the same time, and you're the deacon and the janitor, and you, you bought the pulpit and you bought the speaker. Uh, but if, it's the, if the heart of God is not in you, all of that is described as works of iniquity. Now, what did I say God requires of a commandment? One thing, obedience. Then if the only thing God writes on the heart is his law, what's the only thing God requires of us? Obedience from the heart. And obedience from the heart is a joyful experience. The problem is, many Christians are unconverted. And so it's a miserable, miserable experience for them to obey God because the heart of God is not in them. Church membership is in them. Ellen White writes, The new birth is a rare experience in this age of the world. Now, if it was rare in her day, it is triply rare today. She says, this is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches. She goes on to say, many, so many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die, and so they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. Many, she says, so many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. And the church is overrun with unconverted people. And so they find God's law a burden. But when the heart has been touched by God, when God transfers his heart to ours by writing his law, the same law he wrote on the heart of the human Jesus, he writes on our hearts, then our greatest joy is to obey God. Can you say amen? Because the obedience comes from the heart. And so all God requires of you or of an angel is obedience from the heart. Because all he placed were the Ten Commandments. He did not place the church manual there. He did not place National Geographic. He placed his law of love. And so you can understand now why the wisest man who ever lived said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Let me extend his words. It's also the whole duty of angels. There is nothing God requires of you that falls outside of his heart. Or outside of his what? His law. The law of God is the heart of God. And Jesus came to this earth and for 33 and a half years, he demonstrated what a life should be like when that life is energized by the heart of God. Whose heart is in your bosom tonight?
Do you love to obey God? Do you love God's law? You know, David said, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Only a converted man can speak like that. Does the word, do the words, thou shalt not steal, bring joy to our hearts? Do the words, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, bring some sort of holy excitement to us? Is obedience a burden? If it is, then there's something wrong with the heart. And so tonight, God is offering what? His heart. And he says to us, my heart to your heart. Heart to heart. Take my heart, says God. And he passes it to us through Jesus Christ who has the same heart. Consider the privilege, the heart of God and the heart of Christ is the heart God wants in you. Tonight. How many of you want that heart? Can I see your right hand? You want that heart. May I see your, stand up with me, then I have something else to tell you. Stand to say, I want that heart. Listen carefully to what I'm about to ask you. I want God to give me the right words because I'm a sinner. Examine yourself honestly. Which one of us is living without God's heart? I'm, I'm serious. Based on what you heard, you're living without God's heart. Where's your hands? Don't bring them down. Keep them up. If this is your confession, then we need to do something about it tonight. Are you with me? When Peter said, Lord, save me, the Lord saved him immediately. We need to do something about that tonight. I want you to do something for me. I want you to come right down here. Come quickly. Come. Come. You raise your hand. Come. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come. You think you're living without God's heart. Based on what you've heard, come. And we'll ask God tonight, put his heart in our hearts. You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. You know who the heart deceives first? The person who has it. The heart is so successful at being deceitful, it leads me to think I'm deceiving somebody else. When my heart is deceiving me, the call is, do you think you are living without God's heart? Yes, you're polite, you're educated, you're smooth, you cultured, you know Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know Barack Obama, you know the Queen of England. All of that is fine. Whose heart is beating in your chest? If it's God's heart, it is pumping God's life. If it is not God's heart, the only other choice you have is the heart of Satan. And Satan has many agents who are quiet, polite, well-spoken, very mannerly, but 100% the agents of Satan. Because not all of people, Satan's people roll on the ground, foam at the mouth, and their eyes roll back into their heads. If all of his agents were like that, people would back away. Many of his agents are smooth, polite, nice, but without God's heart in their breasts. For the final time, do you think you've been living without God's heart? I want you to come. Then we'll pray. Ask God, Father, take away this stony heart. And give me the fleshy heart Jesus had. Give me your heart. And accept by faith. When you pray that prayer, God will do it. Pray it with the acknowledgement that I cannot save myself. I need the heart of God. All the Israelites were to have it. And spiritually, the Israelites represented all those who accept Jesus Christ. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Jesus had that same heart. And God wants you to have it tonight. It's coming, come. I believe I've been living without God's heart. God bless you, my good brother. God bless you. You finish early, it's only 22 to 8. Come, sister, God bless you. 
Ah, uh, if only we could understand the great privilege of having God offer his heart to us. His very heart to us. Can you imagine the heart of God in a human being? That's the beauty of the plan of salvation. What else can someone give beside the heart? The heart represents all that you are. An expression of God's unselfishness is his giving of the law, which is his heart. He was so unselfish. He gave his heart, which is his law of love. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word which you spoke to us tonight. We thank you today, God, for the eye-opening experience many of us have had. We've learned that your law proceeded from your heart. From your heart, dear God, to the heart of your Son, who is the mediator between you and us. And from him to the Israelites. But he came as a human being and he had your heart. And he lived with your heart, expressed your life, and he bids us follow him. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, many of us have come to say, based on the light we've received tonight, we have honestly concluded that the heart beating in our breast is not your heart. Father, we ask you now in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive our sins. Forgive us, dear God, for living a life that did not represent you, however pious we may appear on the outside. And we're asking you, God, to Give us now through Jesus Christ and for his sake. Place in us, right in our hearts, your law, which is the law of love, which is your heart. Put in us the very heart you put in Jesus Christ, that your heart may beat and pump your life through us. Father in heaven, without this, we cannot be saved. We are living dead when we do not have your life. Give us your heart, dear God as expressed in the Ten Commandments, the commandments of love. And with your heart in us, we will obey gladly. We will obey joyfully. Obedience will be our highest joy, our greatest delight. We'll be able to say, as Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, and your will is your law. Father in heaven, please, God, we have no one else to go to. So you help us. You invited us to come to the throne of grace, and so we come. You have said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. You said in Ezekiel 33, 11, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We've come to say we want to be saved. Give us your heart today, now, for the sake of Christ. We pray in his name. We believe you've heard us. We accept by faith that you've given us your heart. Dear God, let us leave reckoning ourselves to be living your life because your heart is now in us. Oh, Father in heaven, when we rise tomorrow by your will and your grace, let us ask you again, renew that gift to us. We want to see you face to face, Father, the one who offered his heart. Thank you, God, for this arrangement, heart to heart. And save us when you come, that all of us in that new world, according to 2 Peter 3.13, wherein dwelleth righteousness, and righteousness is the righteousness of the law, which is your character. That's all that will exist in that new world. The righteousness of God has expressed in his law. Thank you, dear God, for this transaction. Thank you for this miracle. We accept it in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Do not doubt that God has done it for you. God does not work by our feelings. He works by the reliability of his word.